hope everybody's well. I know in my class today, Wagner, considerable number of students were freaking out because of uh, midterms and all of those kind of things that make you show a lot better people, <laughs> make us all better people. Um, we've all been there. So we have been talking about um, kind of like the foundations of Islam's attitude towards God, its conceptualization of God. And this class, of course, is Islam for Muslims. You know, they, like after 9-11, it was like Islam for non-Muslims. That's great, it's important, it has a purpose, but at the same time, we have responsibility to teach each other. And so this is like an opportunity to learn sort of formalized text in theology, and then we'll take one in acts of worship, and then we'll take one uh, in spirituality. So last time we were talking about this sort of challenge to present Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as transcendent as is found in the Quran. And we mentioned those first seven qualities that in the poem he talks about that we're studying. He says, So last time we were talking about this sort of challenge. Right? He says in that first line that God exists. We talk about God's existence, what that means, approaches to understanding God's existence, uh, Islam's kind of position on that through scripture and through other means of discussion. Qadim talked about the one who has no beginning. That's important so because maybe after someone, okay, so Islam says that God exists, so then how does he exist? So immediately the first quality is one that takes him beyond the rules of the physical world, takes him beyond the material. So we understand from the word qadim and the awlawiyah that God is not like creation. This is something very important in Islam, and creation is not like God. Al-Baqi means the one who has no ending. We said that what's inferred is that the opposites are things that we don't believe. And classic Islamic theology divides how we look at God and prophets and angels into three ways. What we have to believe, what we have to reject, and what's probable. What's like possible. That's going to be important tonight in our discussion. So he says, Allahu mawjudun, God exists. Qadimun, the opposite of that is birth. Baqi, the opposite of that is death. So God exists, he has no beginning, no end. Mukharifut, mukharifa, lil khalqi bil atlaq. And in complete opposition to the material world. And also vice versa. So you don't have idolatry. You don't have kind of notions of supremacy based on color, gender, language, whatever. We said that that's applied to three things. God's essence, so he's not one of three. Say like in Christianity, can be divided into four because the division is a material measurement. So Islam is very like, no. Quran says, وَلَا تَقُولُ ثَلَثَ Don't say Trinity. But just the mere notion of being able to compartmentalize something or to divide it now gives it a rule which we understand to function in the physical world. God is, in Islam is beyond that. Second is in his actions. So forgiveness, punishment, guiding, nothing is like him. And then in his attributes, mercy, and so on and so forth. The fourth, we said, qa'im bi nafs. Qa'im bi nafs means that God exists because God is God. The word be means because of, right? So I exist because of so many things, oxygen, gravity, whatever, blood pressure. But can Allah qa'im bi nafs? The opposite of that is being reliant on something, needing something. So in our criticism of certain religions that say like God ate, why would God eat? You eat when you need to. And then the last, wahdaniya, oneness. 
And the Quran uses a very powerful word for this, right? Most of the things we're talking about are found in Surah Ikhlas, the third to the last chapter of the Quran. Allah says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah ahad. It doesn't say wahid. The word wahid means like I'm wahid person. So one person, but that implies that there's other people. But if I said I'm Ahad, that would mean I'm the only human being in existence. There's nothing like me. So Qul huwa Allahu Ahad al ahadiyya that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely unique and one. And that Oneness again applies to those three areas. His essence, so he's not one of three, he's not multiple gods. The Quran says if there was more than one God, there'd be chaos. There'd be fighting. Then in actions and in attributes. So this gets into worship, like why do I worship God alone? Because God is only power that can do these things. So Islam's sort of frame, framing of transcendence and this aspect of God's oneness is extremely distilled. It's very intense. And there's a challenge here. He said that early Islamic theologians, most of the people in the early days of Islam's growth, they couldn't read the Quran. Right? The masses couldn't read. So how did they learn theology? How did they learn their faith? So the idea of these 20 ideas that I'm talking to you about were meant to kind of facilitate for people. And then secondly, to give them like a functional literacy, right? to equip them. The third thing is that early Muslims were a minority, even in their own lands. You don't realize this. So Muslims in Iraq, Muslims in Sindh, which is now in Pakistan, Muslims in Khorasan, which is Iran, part of Afghanistan, Muslims in, in the Levant, in Egypt. You know, there were minorities for a few centuries. So how do you equip people who don't have access to literacy with ideas that will allow them to engage the non-Muslims around them? So sort of have to kind of appreciate what's happening here. These 20 attributes are kind of like, you know, zip filing all the text together that people don't have access to. And the goal of this is two things. And this is the challenge. To preserve God's immutable, immutable transcendence. And at the same time, to reinforce God's nearness to us. Those are two kind of contradictory ideas. Something is so incredible, so powerful, and so unique. It's beyond physical world that can be sort of intimidating, I'm sure, for myself. Whenever I've made a mistake or I wanted to repent, I'm like, man, who am I like, you know, to repent? Like, to this all powerful, all, all powerful, all perfect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the next set of attributes are meant to bring about a sense of nearness, sense of meaning, to bring about a relationship. And that's very important because the Quran says, like if they ask you about me, tell them I'm close to them. Wow, that's very powerful, but that's not easy. We find that other religions had a challenge with this, right? So they would affirm God's transcendence, but they couldn't work out his nearness, so they would get into idolatry. Or that they would affirm God's transcendence and then say God, say, had a child. Or nature is God, or right? Because it's a challenge. How do you, how do, you do that? And we find this really beautifully illustrated in the Quran. For example, you know, I don't get too technical, but like in the supplications on Quran, you never find the word yeah. Right? Yeah is used when you want to call someone's like the equivalent of like, yo, feel about town. 
yo, what's up? Right? It's like kind of 25th and beyond. So that that method of calling someone is usually when someone's like far. Yeah, Omar. But in the Quran, whenever you make dua to God, even though God is transcendent, beyond the material realm, realm, do you ever see the word yet in front of those duas? Do you ever see the word yet in front of those supplications? Because it's to say, I'm so close to you, you don't have to say yet. Just call them. So we, we find these ideas in the Quran. And now you and I have an opportunity because the Quran is translated, you know, it's accessible. Most of us are literate, alhamdulillah, I would hope you're here. There's some literacy there. So we, we have access to text in ways that even the companions of the prophet didn't have. So the next seven attributes of God are meant to reinforce, like, don't give up, man. Don't get lost in transcendence. Because if you just leave people in God being super powerful and amazing and unlike all things, they may fall into despondency. We talked about this on Tuesday, right? Imam Ghazali said that fear and hope are like your personal trainer. You know, there's a time for fear, there's a time for hope. There's a time to be inspired, there's a time to be reprimanded. So affirming transcendence is important. And there may be times in my life where I need to think about that transcendence to live for something greater. At the same time, affirming nearness and love and mercy is it could be equally important if I'm down, if I'm struggling, if I'm going through difficulties. So what were those seven? So he says, uh, so the first is that God is alive. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa hayyul qayyum. So that means God is present. In a way that is befitting his transcendence. The second is Qadir. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to talk about this soon, is causing all things to happen, good, evil, success, suffering, pain, happiness, illness, sickness, <coughs> all that's from Allah. Qadir ala kulli shay. That's why the Prophet in his supplication said, Ant la taqdir wa la aqdir. Like you have all power, I have no power. The third is aliman. That God knows. The Quran says, لا يخفى عليه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء. Nothing is hidden from God. God knows all things. The fourth, we'll talk about this tonight, is مريدا, willing. Everything that we see is an extension of Allah's will. Nothing is independent of that will. Nothing escapes that will. Sami'an wasiran mutakallimu lahu sifat sabaatun tamfadu. And the rest he says that God is hearing, God is perceiving, God is speaking. Why, why didn't they start with these seven first? Like, why would you talk about how you understand transcendence, how we understand? that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no likeness. There's nothing like him in the material world. There's nothing in the material world like him before you would say that God speaks, hears, and talks. Why? Like, why not start there? Why is it important to frame the Islamic idea of God's perfection first before you start to talk about those things? It's a question. Yes. Oh, are you asking us literally? Yeah, it's not rhetorical. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's my bad. It's been a long day. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess like because uh, those are attributes that we also have. Um, so you would like think about God as like a something more reachable, number one. But also like, would you really talk to something or speak to something 
uh, per se, if you didn't regard it higher than you in asking it for forgiveness or asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. Excellent. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah, I also feel like uh, would people still make the mistake of writing edit of God because in the beginning we just made that distinction. So everything that still comes back. So now when we go on talking about all of this that we are familiar with, alive, capable, long being, and we know things that happen, but we already have the previous knowledge, so it cannot be any of the things that we have. Yeah, so we want to frame transcendence because and as you said also, like you think about hearing, talking, first thing that we're going to imagine is us, but it could lead to idolatry. Right? It could lead to associating God with creation. And that's why, just to FYI, in the classic system of Islamic education, theology is taught before the Quran. And that's what the companions of the Prophet meant when they said, Ta'alamna al-imana qabal al-Quran. Right? We were taught how to think about God, about prophets, before we engage religious text. Because we find in the Quran text that if we were to interpret them literally, would imply that God has material attributes. So learning this first, you kind of see something here. It's kind of a system of how a classical Islamic education happens. So before tafsir is theology, before Quran is theology. So then I have the lenses, and that's what happens most of the time. People read even the Quran. By no means would I ever discourage anyone from reading the Quran, but they might not have that background and they get confused. Or they may read like hadith that God laughed, God descends every night to the heavens. They might not have those lenses and they'll think, whoa, whoa laugh, descends. So the attribute that he is not like anything that is temporary. And you have to appreciate now, and I don't want to make this too complicated. Why does he say no beginning, no ending, and then in opposition to temporal things? Because he has no ending, no beginning. So these attributes are meant to bring about a sense of meaning. That's why they're called sifat al ma'ani. They bring meaning to this. The first was sifat al-nafs, then sifat al-salbiya, then sifat al -man. What does that mean? Sifat al-nafs, existence. Sifat al-salbiya, that the opposite is forbidden. And sifat al-ma'ani, it's bringing meaning to this relationship now. So by this, something incredible is accomplished. And that is the balance between being in awe of God loving God, being inspired to live for a greater purpose, but then also finding meaning in the relationship. As the prophet captured beautifully when he said to one of his uh, students, right? Be mindful of God and God will take care of you. So what were those attributes again? Sifat al-ma'ani, living. The opposite of that is death. God doesn't die. There's no beginning, no ending. Number two, all powerful. Perhaps that would be weakness. But that something else shares in his power. Wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir. Doesn't say wallahu qadirun ala kulli shayin arabic. Wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir. And God over all things is in control. Nothing else is. All things are administered by God. And sometimes, uh, if we're not careful, right, the furnishings of our mind and heart are largely pushed by popular culture, not even other religions. Like religion has begun to take a backseat in, in, in the West and it's being replaced by political nomenclature. Now people treat politics like it's their religion. So there's a challenge there that if I'm not informed, and that's why this is important, right? If I'm not informed of these things, I may be supplementing Islamic ideas with other things that are actually maybe foreign to Islam. 
And God is merciful, right? Freak anybody out here. But like you find sometimes Muslims like, you know, I think God hates me. Why? Because bad things are happening. Don't think God hates you. This is not the stock exchange. Or you'll find Muslims will be like, well, God made good and the devil makes evil. No, he doesn't. All things are from God. And that's kind of an outcome of like contemporary or contemporary society is the feel good nature of Western spirituality, right? It, it, it's right because it feels good. Not necessarily. The third thing we said is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing. It's the only true will. And all of these qualities were, was, and will be. They don't like start, they don't finish because we understand them having no beginning, no ending. There's no like good day, bad day, off, on, resting on the seventh day. None of that happens. Allah's will was, is, and will be in the future. His knowledge was, is, and will be. His power was, is, and will be. Infinite. The opposite of that will be has no will, but there's other wills. And that gets us into, we'll talk about probably in two weeks, like how does human utility work then? How does that work out? And then the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. The opposite would that, that would be like partial ignorance or complete ignorance. It's impossible for us to believe that. And God got tricked. Then hearing and seeing, of course, the opposite will be that he doesn't, he's not aware and speaking. How does that impact me? So if I know Allah is alive, I'm going to live a certain type of lifestyle. And I carry myself a little different. If I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful, the only true power, then I'm going to talk about this momentarily. You know, I'm going to be brave with the truth, man. I find my authority from something else. I haven't outsourced my values. But know that Allah is all-knowing, and there's duality to all these. Like, so power can come in, like, when I need to be motivated, but power can also remind me, like, man, I better live right. Knowledge can also be, like, a motivator when I feel down, when I feel alone. I can turn to Allah. Imam Chef, he said, when I feel lonely, I talk to Allah. Remember me, I remember you. Allah has our back, alhamdulillah. But at the same time, if I'm doing something wrong or attempted to do something wrong, I can remind myself that I'm not alone. That I'm being observed. So it inspires me to stay away from, from evil, ideally. And that extension of all hearing, all seeing, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do we just take quickly? We took these major foundational ideas about God. Existence, no beginning, no ending. Opposition to creation. Unlike creation, creation is unlike him completely independent, the one. Then we talked about living, all power, the only power. The, all, the willing, the all-knowing, the seeing, the hearing, and the speaking. You can take these and apply these to like many different situations. But the idea here is to give you like these kind of universal ideas because each of our life is very different. We may experience particulars that are unique to ourselves. But these 20 ideas, if you will, 21, 22 ideas, 24 maybe, ideas about God as a Muslim will equip me to go like interfaith discussion in say youth group halaqa. MSA disputes, challenges in my life. 
I'm able to plug these in and reinforce myself. And, and we have to appreciate that Islamic theology in its bare core is easy. Its application could become complex with the complexities of life. So if you take every single thing I mentioned, like God's existence, and you read stories in the Quran of the prophets, you're going to find God's existence in times of need of motivation, times of, like say, Nayunis, being encouraged to do good. Allah having no ending, no beginning, you're going to find this is rooted in the idea of not being unhealthily attached to the temporary world. Allah SWT is opposition to creation. You find that the prophets are teaching, like the Bible even says, it, There's, thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's nothing like him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Independence is invoked to give us a sense of richness and fulfillment. That's we rely on tawakku on Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. So our worship is for him alone, not for anyone else. That Allah SWT is alive. Asma'u wa ara. Allah says to Moses and, and Aaron, Musa and Harun, don't be scared. I hear and see everything. Don't worry about Fir'aun. So now I can even think about how this plays out in liberation theology within the Muslim community. How do I think this plays out, for example, in social justice issues? Allah is with me. And all of these things are meant to reinforce one very important concept that we've talked about in the past. And that is that all of them brought together are going to give me the capacity to do what the prophet said, to worship Allah as though you see him, even though you can't see him, you know he sees you. It's called mushahadat. That takes us to our final piece of discussion for the evening, and then we'll continue next week. And that is, what is permissible for us to believe about God? So if you take everything I just mentioned, those attributes, and you take the opposites, those are impermissible. So let me give you an example. Existence, non-existence. No beginning, beginning. No ending, death. Not like creation, this is called tashbi or tamthi, similarity or simile or complete likeness. Qa'im bi nafs, absolute independence, needs. Uh, oneness, shirk. Alive, safallah, dead. All powerful, not powerful. Willing, no will. So you can see how it plays out. Knowledge, ignorance. Seeing, not seeing. Hearing, not hearing. Speaking, not speaking. So all of those, if you take them together, it's going to be like 24. That's it. That's your opinion. If you're a Muslim, that's all you need to know. That's it. People are like, but I just, I want to get like in some like cool esoteric stuff. Well, that's for you to discover for yourself. It's nothing wrong with that, but that's for you to uncover. That's for me to uncover. Within the area of those foundational attributes and qualities, um, I have like a hundred of them apps, sorry. Uh, the wet on this fudger. My wife is like, are you going to wake up? <laughs> wake up. It's like, I, I got the break, bro. <laughs> like a hundred apps on my phone but but those things are plugged into our own experiences and sometimes we look too much to the community to help us navigate our own particulars where what we equip ourselves alhamdulillah with these qualities and with these attributes did we live our lives and that, uh, that's why i said um earlier that you know for me as someone who embraced islam islam is very much about exploration that's how you want to take these things. How do you explore the contours of these different relationships? That takes us to the permissible. Like, what do we mean by je is? I can believe this about God. I don't have to believe this about God. And uh, 
Sheikh Marzuki says, Waja is on the fadli he wadli, Turkuli munkinim kafalihi. He says in the poem that it's probable for us to believe about God probabilities due to two things Allah's justice and Allah's blessings. What he's talking about here is a framework for seeing fate. So in general, bad things, difficulties, and challenges are seen through the prism of justice. And people ask, like, if God is just, how could he punish someone with everlasting hell? Because he's just. You can ask them, a five-minute crime usually gets what kind of sentence? 30, 40 years. What about a life of crime? Maybe someone is like, doing well in life, and they're like, I'm unworthy of this. That's from the fadl of Allah. That's from Allah's blessings. Just roll with it. One of my teachers used to say, if you're so insecure with yourself, then be secure with the one who gave it to you. That's very normal. It's a good quality sometimes, but we don't want our insecurities to become like, where they override our ability to function, right? So sometimes I just got to trust God more than I trust my worthiness. God knows better than me. This is called ja'izat or mumkinat. What are those kind of things? They tend to deal with qada and qadr. Fate. And I look at the world through these things. And in Islam, we are encouraged to think about these two things. Success and challenges through two characters. First is gratitude. So if things are going well, I'm in a place of gratitude. The second is resilience. But the question is resilience against what? We never talk about it. We just say like, be patient with what? Be resilient, suburb, suburb. With what? For that, we need to unpack the idea of how Islam looks at the world. From a theological perspective, the lenses, lenses of theology. This is sort of important, man, and this may be eye-opening for some of you, and I'm gonna make it as, hopefully as palatable as possible. Because usually when I teach this to people, they're like, wow, man, I know that. And I believe, that's why the book that I'm actually teaching, I'm writing it now to be taught like in high schools, right? You need to like really educate. It's, it's not easy being young, man. It's not easy being young as a Muslim in the United States. And it's not easy in being faithful. Like you live in a world now which the idea of belief is questioned. Whereas you know, pre-Newton, the idea of disbelief was kind of impossible. As one of our students said a few weeks ago, like in, in post-modernity to be a believer is to be a heretic. So it can be hard regardless. And that's where we can work with other faith communities. Like it's a challenge. But we look at the world in three ways when it comes to probabilities. Number one is the decree of God. Allah is murid, the willing, and his will is preeminent and ageless. That's one of the things you can tell yourself when good things happen and you don't feel worthy, is that was decreed before creation that you would be where you are. SubhanAllah. Or vice versa, in order to swallow sometimes not getting what we want. So the decree of God is called Qadr. That's the decree of God. How that decree plays out in creation is called Qadr. The word Qadr means to measure. So how it comes to you. It's called a Ta'alluq. So we have this preordainment. I like to use preordainment. 
The second component of how we look at the material world is the command of God. So the decree, the command. The third component in this is the choice, the freedom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and I to choose. Cognition, our, our will, our many wills. So here, let me repeat it again. See, world, the world is made up of God's decree, immutable, nothing can stop it. God's command, our choice. What's called kasb. Kasb al-abd. In the Quran, laha ma kasabat wa alayha maktasabat. What I've chosen. Here's the question. Do you think that the decree of God and the command of God can be contradictory? simple question don't worry like there's no wrong answer right we're all here together we're all learning together alhamdulillah and oftentimes you end up sharing things that are much more insightful than myself i'm just from oklahoma simple grandson of harmless but thinking about this right the decree of god and the command of god can those be contradictory i think Maybe I'm overthinking this, but not if they would might be contradictory if we didn't have the idea of us as well. For example, it's the command of God upon us to pray. But then it's God and I'm not praying right now. But because we also have the idea of us, it's that I choose not to. So in that sense, they're not contradictory. What are you and saying, man? <laughs> It's okay. We're, dude, I like the group. I like the. I'm not wearing mismatching socks. I have blood clots in this leg, so I have to wear a special, <laughs> special type of sock. People always ask me, like, are you trying to make a fashion statement? I'm just trying to stay alive, bro. <laughs> uh, <coughs> yes. No, that's me working through it. Is that if not for the fact that the third point was caused, then someone could make the argument, I'd say, that they, are, they, they can be contradictory. Because again, the command is that we do certain things and don't do certain things. But then if someone is not following that command, they can say, but well, that's just God, that's just God preordained it that I don't. But then because we have that layer of cusp and our, of my choice to not do those things, that sort of resolves any contradiction in that regard. Ooh. Okay. What else? I was waiting for you guys to stretch your legs. And when you did, I was like, yes, I can stretch my <laughs> mind. So always feel free to stretch your legs. Alhamdulillah. It works for me. Who else? Command of God, decree of God. Can it contradict? We're not talking about cusp right now. We're talking about those two things. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I believe I can hear you. What else did I uh, so I think the answer is yes, they can contradict. For example, uh, Allah uh, commands that never single Quran, but he decrees in the same Quran that like uh, if you wanted to rule under everyone, this is many people, but some people will not be able to comment. So there's like a command and a decree that just Yes, good. Anyone else over okay. here? Jump it. If they were contradictory in that sense, then we wouldn't have like the option of free will. Like that would also, like our right to free will would also be infringed, I guess, or contradicted because the act of him giving us free will is for us to come to that conclusion and worship him ourselves. Mm -hmm. So his commandment is for us to worship him and do those things stated in the Quran. But at the end of the day, he's not going to force us to. Because even though, because it is his decree, I guess, that we come to that conclusion ourselves and we decide to worship him. Nice. That's why this, this way of teaching this is very important because it really kind of helps you settle some of the philosophical questions you may have on your own. 
right? So the answer is yes, they can contradict each other. This is very important as we build our relationship with like liturgy, worship, justice, the soul, all that is gonna come out of this idea. And the idea that we find is found in a religious text is that, for example, God commands us to pray, but he's decreed some people aren't gonna pray. God's commanded us to be justice in the just in the law. God loves the just. Everybody is just. And C.S. Lewis, great Christian theologian, you know, he has this small essay called The Problem with Suffering. He tries to kind of grapple with this. How do, how do I understand suffering? Now, Dr. Sherman Jackson in the Muslim community has this rather well-written book called Islam and the problem of black suffering. Post Arab Spring, a lot of questions popped up about like theodicy. Like, now we see now Tunis is even struggling to maintain the, the last breath of the Arab Spring. People begin to wonder like, why is this happening? So for Muslims, we believe that God's decree can be contradictory by his rule and vice versa. Why though? That answers the question about resilience. What am I resilient with? I'm resilient with the command in face of the decree. So everybody around me is doing wrong, but I'm being commanded to live right. That takes a lot of internal kind of patience and drive. If I see the world around me falling apart, that can get to me, man. And it's very normal for it to get to us. We're not made of iron, right? We're made of flesh and blood. But I find solace and strength in the command. And how this plays out is philosophically now I understand that evil is a test. Just like the tree, don't eat from the tree. And, and that one of the weapons of Satan is definitions. Don't come close to it. Don't come close to the tree, Adam and his wife. Satan says, He plays with the reality. You know, the only reason that God told you not to eat from the tree is because you're going to live forever or become an angel. It's an issue of definitions. Second thing he uses to kind of sway the resolve is peer pressure. When, when, when Satan talks to Adam and his wife in the Quran, this is the first example of false advertisement and peer pressure. He always speaks in the plural. It's like a lot of us know this, but you don't know it. So the more I'm familiar with the command, and the more I'm familiar with God's transcendence, the stronger I'll be anchored in the face of currents, which maybe I'm seeing to choose the command over the qada at that moment. Although both of them are gonna be encapsulated eventually by a qada, of course, but my choice comes into play. So that doesn't allow me to give in to like more relativism or to like what's necessarily popular. It's like being a bully or hurting people, or, you know, making others feel unworthy or teasing people everyone's doing that at my school or mistreating people i stick to the command so you can see how this plays out in religious justice not social justice that islamic religious justice is rooted in the fact that yes there can be contradictions social justice is encapsulated by this so certainly this is meaningful because if you think about this, and this is perhaps gonna help bring this hadith 
into a clear understanding for you, this tradition of the prophet. And you ask yourself, how do I worship God as though I see him? By choosing the command over the decree. So if everything around me is wrong, and that's what I see with my eyes, my heart chooses the command. That's worshiping Allah as though I see him, even though I can't see him. I know he sees me. And this hadith is the foundation of everything. So the problem of pain. And that's why the prophet talks about those people who are resilient in the face of illness, tests, trials. Their rewards are infinite, right? Because they chose resiliency. But at the same time, if I see, this is very important. Because sometimes people will say this. Well, you know what's happening to certain people. This is God's decree. So whatever, as you kind of said earlier. Like, you know, I'm just rolling with God's decree. In this understanding now, am I allowed to invoke that? Or do I invoke his command? You see something here now. So I'm not able to use providence as an excuse to not act prophetic. And when I frame my life like this, I began to see like how I have to be very careful about harming or causing pain to others. That takes us to the third component as we stop, and that's choice. People tend to ask a number of questions that we'll build on next week, but I'll leave with one idea. And that is that God knows what our choice will be. God has decreed our choice. And that brings about the question of then, why try? Right? If God knows and God has decreed, why should I even try? And the answer is very simple, maybe a little too simple, but that is if I affirm God's perfect knowledge as an excuse not to act on that perfect knowledge, it's a contradiction. Think about what I said. If I'm like, well, God knows all things, so therefore I'm not going to act on his knowledge. And that means really I don't what? I don't affirm that Allah is all-knowing. Because if the all-knower told me, live like this, be like this, then I, then I should do it. If I came to you and there was a house burning down, and I said, hey, man, here's the blueprints. Use these blueprint, blueprints, because if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. You're like, that's not fair. You know everything in the house. I don't need your blueprints. You just run in the house. So you're now you're using my knowledge against me. Where in fact, that knowledge is what to help you. In this temporary world that Allah has created, it says, and then tells you and I act like this, live like this. I can't say, well, because he knows all, I'm not gonna act on what he knows. That doesn't make any sense. So then the problem is really with trusting God's knowledge. That's the challenge.